which is the yeah, best yeah. way to maximize my on lessons from the C++11 standard. Do you have a laptop here? Okay, I have a laptop in the room too if you want to try it afterwards. So, quick introduction for anyone who's not met me during the weekend. Uh, I'm Alistair Meredith, the name's quite clearly written on the badge. Um, I've been an ISO C++ committee member since early 2003. And I'm now the current library working group chair, having taken over from the man hiding at the back here. Thank you, Alan, who was actually chair for the majority of the work that you're going to hear about here. So anything that worked well, it's all down to Howard and everything else you can blame me for. So what's this session? My, my goal for the session, I don't know what your expectations coming in. I'm not sure how well I wrote it up. Uh, to tell you what I personally learned during the efforts of standardizing C++11 to an extent that I think the committee learned during the process. So you're going to hear some war stories about some of the interesting experiences we had in the process. Uh, an appreciation of what's actually in the standard specification. There's more to the standard than just code. And hopefully along the way we're going to get some useful library design guidelines, which I guess is what possible what we came here looking for. They're not quite incidental, they are part of the goal, but they're going to come through the, uh, hopefully, a, a more conversational approach. So, what was my first standard meeting like? Uh, I turned up for the, the first meeting was in Oxford 2003. Uh, the standard committee made this terrible decision to set up a meeting 10 miles down the road from where I had done work. So I figured I had no excuse not to go to that one. Well, I hadn't got a clue how the process worked, so this was all very much finding it out on the hoop as you go. So this is an interesting meeting to have as a first meeting. It happened to be the meeting where the majority of TR1, uh, the, the new library extension they were working on, was selected and chosen. This was a very big technical decision, so since I happened to be hanging around the library working group, that was a very exciting time to be there. Uh, in the meantime, Diana opened up the evolution working group to start looking at extensions for the language for the first time in the last five or six years at that point. So there was an awful lot of buzz around exciting things happening with C++ OX turning into whatever it would become. One of the more interesting sessions at that meeting that uh, I'm sure <laughs> David down here has more than a few uh, memories of, uh, there was an attempt to remove ex the export template feature from the language, which was um, a little unfortunate as um, a little compiler group who have representatives sitting here now, have to have actually just implemented the feature at the time. And I'm not sure how much that was the cause of a panic of the other compiler vendors realizing, oh, someone's called our bluff, we don't want to do it too. <laughs> so there was a, a very interesting diving into the process of planning, you know, how does the C++ committee work? What are the dynamics around here? That was an interesting session to be observing, and I was very glad to be sat at the back and not participating. But uh, so it was an exciting meeting to see as my first meeting. <laughs> But I had no clue what, how these meetings worked. So I was, I'd spoken to Beeman a couple of times on the boost list, and he sort of facilitated an introduction to get me there. But not knowing any better, I thought, I'd better have a proposal I've written up to show to justify why I'm here. Surely everyone comes to these meetings with their proposals. I knew nothing about how proposals actually were presented to the group. I knew nothing about the standard mailings that they go out in. So I had a proposal, but it wasn't in the mailing. And I turned up, and Turned out that wasn't really necessary, so I was happily hiding at the back, pretending that I'd never done this and you know, I was going to get away and slink away and have an interesting week there. But what did I pick to write up? I picked um, the, the, what is now the standard array type. Um, I picked it because it was the simplest, non-trivial piece of code I could find to write up. I found at least three existing versions in print, so I knew I wasn't being in the slightest bit original, which is always a help if you don't want to make a fool of yourself in front of a large crowd. And uh, there was a version in Boost, so we'd got you know, fair user experience out there, and I could point directly at that. And I say, it's um, for something I didn't know better and just turned up on to this is the thing that will serve as my entry, my entry pass, it's now part of the C11 standard, and I'm actually quite proud of that. So, what did I learn from going through this process? Well, first I learned that the proposal wasn't actually necessary. Uh, I almost got away with it, apart from the fact Beeman knew I was doing this. So right at the end, when everyone's saying, here's all the proposals we've seen for TL1, we've seen the set, Beeman sticks his hand up and says, this new guy you've not spoken to all week, he's got a proposal. <laughs> so I then had to go through the wonderful review process. It is an interesting experience. You've got a room full of really smart people who know how to dissect these things, and 
you find out if you've written up what you thought you'd written up. And a couple of more notes here. Yeah. Although I didn't need to have a proposal, it was definitely the best way to get involved at a standards meeting and find out how things worked. Uh, as you can see, one of the important side effects is I enjoyed it, I kept going back. Uh, it might have helped that the following meeting was in Hawaii and the one after that was in Sydney, Australia. So. <laughs> it was a fun way to travel the world, meet some interesting people, and before you knew it, I was now having a regular vacation two or three times a year with a bunch of interesting people to talk to. Not a bad way to spend your vacation time if you're looking for an excuse. I was, uh, didn't have a family, so that was certainly not an issue for me. Um, one of the things you'll learn is I know how to write a library. I maybe know how to document it for a set of users. But writing a proposal for the C++ standard, this is a specification that's written in a specific way, and this is part of the review. You want your document to go in and look like it's a part of an integral whole. So even if you think you've done a perfect job, you might have done so. But part of the process is learning how to say it in a form of standard wording. It's not too hard, but if you turn up thinking, look at this wonderful job I've done, be prepared to take a few knockbacks as well. And in the end, what the key lesson I learned is the specification is actually all that matters when it's going into the standard. Implementations are useful experience, they can guide what you've learned. But the standard doesn't publish your code, it publishes your specification. So, pitching proposals for the, what goes into the standard, you have to think about it in terms of a specification, rather than a library implementation. And this is a lesson I'm always relearning. So, moving on from the first meeting. Library TR1 is where the, the library working group was going. I have to t attach myself to the library because I'd gone in under the auspices of uh, talking to Beeman. That evolution stuff sounded really exciting and interesting, but I kind of felt like I'd already guilted myself into playing with the library group. And, well, they were delivering stuff. There's this new TR coming out. And it was a very productive group to be in. The evolution group were just kicking off and they all sorts of exciting discussions, but nothing was coming out yet. The library TR, this was going to be something public in two or three years. Which in committee timescales is fast. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that at the time either, I do now. Um, many of the new libraries in the library TR1 came directly from Boost, where there was already a large user, a sub, not sure how large the user community was back in 2003, it was certainly growing. And these, these libraries were well documented by people who learned how to come together and write these documents that were maybe not quite standard specifications, but one of the ideas when Boost was set up was this was a place to incubate libraries for the standard. So the people who founded Boost were also encouraging people to document them in a style that would then be compatible when it came time to move into the standard. So we had a large number of libraries came in from Boost, which worked out fairly well. They were already well tested, well documented. They were close to being in the form of a specification, so we spent two or three meetings still, so that's you know, 18 months, two years, massaging the way we word these things. But essentially the libraries came in fairly directly as they were written. And one of the big bonuses that came from this was there were a lot of new committee members from the Boost community who joined up at this time. And that's a, been a valuable asset for the standing committee ever since. We've really been able to grow and do a lot more work from bringing in bright people who come from this community. And there were another, a number of other contributions that were in TR1, notably the unordered containers came in from Matt Austin, who had got clear experience of doing this with the previous standard. Um, the special math functions came in as a proposal for here's a math textbook saying we want these functions. So the uh, scientific community at Fermilabs had identified which set of additional functions would be really useful by referencing the existing ISO standard, which is always a good way to cheat your way into the system. If you have existing standards, it can help a lot. And there was a, a tie-up with the uh, standard C library at that point from the C99 standard. But again, a large amount of work that came from this group around here. So what did we learn from producing TR1? Well, it gave us a bunch of useful libraries that could then move fairly directly into C++ LX when the time was right. And they were already in a fairly good shape because We'd written them once, we'd gone through the standardization process once. So we learned a lot as a group about how this new group of people who were 
But think about it, the largest standard group community at this point. A lot of the people who had been there to specify the 1998 standard, as I understand, it was a fairly grueling process. So we actually had a much younger group of, of relatively people on the standard going through this process. There were certainly a few veterans around, like Beeman, who got me on board, and Bill Plager, who's another man who's been there since the start, I believe. But there was a lot of young blood, and going through the TR1 process, we learned how to function as part of the committee. That was a very helpful process that was going to pay off an awful lot over the following years of C11. And we also learned that maybe not all the things that we put in were going to be able to go forward. We thought we'd done a great job on the math functions library. Boost actually provided a full, complete implementation of the math function libraries that vendors could just pick up and ship. And then Microsoft put their hand up and said, but even if we have a perfect implementation given to us for free, we don't want to have advanced math PhDs on the technical support line dealing with customers phoning up about what they think they found as a bug. So, so the ability to even support this stuff is a, partly a function of what can make it into the standard. And so what we did with the math standard was we took the rest of TR1. This was still an important, valuable piece of work, so we discovered another avenue we could have for it. There is now a separate ISO standard for a binding for C++ to these standard engineering and scientific mathematical functions. So the work wasn't wasted, even there. So at this point, we have to start asking ourselves, what is it we're actually working on? What is the C++ standard library? It's, it's a collection of useful classes and functions that we can use to get our work done. It's a um, bunch of useful code that ships with the compiler. We certainly expect it to be there. It's a vocabulary, it's some interesting names that we can use there to communicate and talk to other C++ developers, and we all know we're talking about the same thing. Or at a more fundamental level, the objects we're trading are the same type. We're not having to you know, keep translating from one person's idea of what this thing looks like to another. Having a shared vocabulary is very important, and I'll come back to that on the next slide. And something a lot of people who think about languages, they just think about the compiler and the syntax. And that's definitely an important part of the language. But if all you have is a compiler, the kind of programs you can write are fairly basic. The library is a very fundamental part of the C++ language as it is. Um, features that you might look to find in the language are often implemented in, in the library, which means you know, it's much easier for us to change, adapt, and evolve them over time. Uh, it's an easier way to get a new feature kind of into the language, a good example being something like the boost function line, the TR1 function and now standard function. A generic callback facility, far more powerful than the function pointer, but it's implemented as a library facility rather than have to go down into the core language. So libraries really are a fundamental part of your language, especially when, again, you're thinking in terms of the vocabulary. And what do I, what do I mean by vocabulary? If I start using these terms, they, come out of the set, they came out of the standard, but we've got a fairly clear idea if we're talking to any other C++ developer what we're talking about. If I talk about a container, uh, does anyone not know, think they know what I'm talking about if I use the term container? If I talk about an iterator, it's not an actual type in the language, but it's a vital piece of vocabulary for us to talk about how we design and implement algorithms. And Steph is pointing out that actually it is a... <laughs> Yes, we do actually have a template called standard iterator in the library, and it's not an iterator. That's so awesome. <laughs> what, what is it? It's a base type that helps you build conforming iterators. It provides a lot of useful type depth and things so that your iterator looks like it has the right form. But it knows nothing about iteration, it's just a way to import names. Um, some of the other names that we've started throwing around in the standard that bring value out of the specification are things like copy constructible. If I start talking about constraints on algorithms and how I'm going to implement these things and what users have, have to do to supply them, we need a lot of words to describe the context of all these things. And over years, the standard has evolved a number of terms, copy constructible being a, a, a simple example, that make it much easier to specify things. And if, if we use the shared vocabulary that's in the standard, it greatly enriches the C++'s community's ability to produce and document their own algorithms and libraries and features. Um, string is, again, it's a vital vocabulary type. In this case, it really is a type. But we, 
we don't want a chaos of every single C++ product inventing its own string type and then having to convert between all the different forms. The string type we have might not be the best type in the world, but it's the type that everyone knows that we've got. And yeah, so just make supplying vocabulary types that you can use in functions is a, it's a important facility. Uh, another example of vocabulary type streams. This is kind of a mix of a framework, we know what the stream framework means, and there's also actually specific streams classes that form that, that we use as the basis that help us communicate. So again, there's a vital piece of vocabulary comes out of that. So, it's not what people think about when they think about you know, what you get from the C++ standard, but the vocabulary that we now share is actually a vital piece of what we've grown. So my claim is the C++ standard, fundamentally it's the specification or standard library, sorry, it's the specification and not the implementation of that library. Uh, how do we, what is that specification? We document all the public interfaces, because the public interfaces are the only parts of the code that's visible to, 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 to the user that they can rely on for the standard. And implementation details, so effectively private parts of classes, might be hinted to give you an idea of what we're thinking of as a class designer as how this is going to work. But, all you're going to get from the standard is, here's an interface you can write code against. So fundamentally, it's a contract between the users of the library and the implementers. And both people need to clearly understand what they think that contract means. So a large part of working on the C++ standard, yes, we design a library, we have lots of ideas about how it's going to be used. But unless we've clearly specified exactly how these features are going to interoperate, uh, code's going to fall apart. So a, lot, a large part of the skill that I was learning and evolving during the time here is how to write a clear, concise specification. And here we're going to hear some of the journey about how that mental on slides to come. And another interesting part that comes out of having a specification rather than an implementation is that different library vendors implementing the library can make different design choices. So if you think of something like the unloaded containers, there are many different ways that you can supply a, um, a hash container in data structure that's backing up these containers. Different design trade-offs for what you're optimizing, which cost you're paying. And different vendors are picking different solutions. And they're competing to try to find, they've got the best version, they want your custom, so it's... One of the benefits of the standard is we, we, we can leave the field open to competition and have people working to make the best library you can possibly have, while still you as a consumer can write portable code, and you can switch between the different libraries, and it shouldn't make a difference to you in terms of whether your program works, pick the one that's going to give you your preferred performance characteristic in the code that you're working on. So that was my introduction. At this point, we've just shipped standard library TR1. We've got a fair idea that this is what we want to incorporate into the new C++ standard. What goals, what are we going to go out to try and achieve with the C++ standard library? Uh, obviously, one of the key things is we want to add more facilities to the library. We want to grow the library. Um, just going off page count, the new library in C++11 is roughly twice the size of the library in C++03. And coming from the, um, the evolution group, one of the key facilities that was going to be in C++11 was a focus on concurrency. It was long past time that the modern architectures that people are going to be dealing with, certainly now, everything now has multiple cores, multiple threads running, and if the language doesn't talk to that, um, yeah, it, we had a dead language. So concurrency was going in at the language as a, at a fundamental level, and it was kind of important that the library could also support generating threads and running concurrent, creating concurrent programs. Another, that, that was just one feature coming from the language. There are clearly going to be a whole bunch of new language features that would have a bearing on how you design a library or how you express a library interface. And then we're going to have to figure this out on the fly because these language features don't exist at this point in the standard, but they're going to come in and we're going to want to adopt them and apply them through our existing standard while still trying to grow it with all these new facilities. And we already had an, exact, uh, an existing defect report list with a, at the time I joined up, I think our book, the, the highest number of defect report was just 
just over 400, and we've probably outplayed half, two thirds of those. It's a continual process of, as people file bug reports with us, we take them out, analyze them. If there's a real bug there, we have to go and update the document and fix and solve this. By the time we came out of C++11, that 400 over the next eight years became about 1,600. People were reading our stuff and giving us feedback. And again, one of the key products we're producing is the standard. So cleaner, more consistent text makes the standard itself much easier to read and absorb. I believe you now actually have a much better quality document than we had back in 2003, which in turn was a much better quality document than the one that was there in 1998. And hopefully, the standards to come, we will get cleaner and better again. I have a uh, question. Yes. Go back in the it's a preserved bug report, but before you said it's just a specification, not an implementation. So it's bugs in terms of the way it was designed, or? Potentially, we have specified a feature badly, so the design just doesn't work. Potentially, we've said different things in different places, and they contradict each other. We can't do both. Pick one. <laughs> Um, sometimes we've just said something in a confusing manner, so it's ambiguous, it can be read two or three different ways. So let's be clear and specify which of those unambiguously is intended. Right. And sometimes it's just a spelling mistake. <laughs> <laughs> we take all sorts. Yeah, and, and there's just no information between, and, uh, also sometimes it's terminology that we use Yes, it doesn't help when we have three different terminologies to mean the same thing. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, along the same lines that you're talking about having multiple versions of the same library optimized for various different factors like mm -hmm. performance or area, do you think of uh, creating multiple corner cases and including that in the library so I can have an area container and all its algorithms, area container and all its algorithms perform uh, optimized for area or optimized for speed? Mm -hmm. so, Various corner cases included in the library. I'm not sure what you mean by corner cases there. Like various, uh, let's say, optimization metrics. There are there are a few examples of that. Um, like if you use regex, there's a flag uh, optimize where you say I'm willing to spend more time doing regex construction because I want the actual process of matching to be super fast. And that's again to the implementation that hey maybe you should use a, an FA to DFA transformation. Uh, which could be very expensive, but it's a long term cost. Um, or there's various other tuning parameters. But it's not super common. If, you, what, if, if you're talking about supplying hooks in the APIs to indicate what level of optimization you're after, or just have multiple library versions and optimize for different factors. Well, that, that would be a library vendor's choice. So the specification gives you the, the behavior you can guarantee and rely on. And if their optimizations don't meet that behavior, that's a bug in that implementation. Right. And you can point them to the standard and say, no, this is what it's supposed to do. That's why we have a standard. We have a, a shared understanding. So, I mean, so it, it should be the same, but like, you know, different implementations of, from different yeah. variables may that. Yeah. And there's a, a couple of those design points will be coming up later on in the slides as well. So. Uh, David? So you mentioned that it's not, sometimes you have a bug report that says, well, this code, in this specification is ambiguous, you know, we can read this to two different mm -hmm. ways. Have you guys ever had situations where two vendors have actually already gone ahead and implemented something two different ways, and you have to basically tell one of the vendors, sorry, you know, you'll have to do it? I'm pretty sure we've done that a number of times, but I can't remember any specific instances. How much grinning at the back? Can you remember any? All right, just putting you on the spot as well. Oh, gosh. What, what about the, uh, Seems like there's been enough. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble picking one. Uh, the contiguity of uh, I don't think anyone had any contiguity issues. There was some, some different issues with string that I'll be coming to. Um, with the unordered containers, we had an, an issue with when you call erase, I believe it is, it's now got to return an iterator to the next element. And that's got to happen in constant time. And some of the existing data structures, if you take out the last element of a bucket in your hat container, it's got to find the next bucket to give you the element. So if you're backing structures just one long list, that's fine. You're just finding the next element in that list. But if you've got to go walking the set of buckets to find the not, next non-empty bucket, that's very hard to do in constant cost. So this was having an impact about how some people had to potentially redesign their data structures this on different code. Yeah. So yes. Uh, we have had that issue. 
Hopefully. Hopefully, we, the majority of times this comes up, hopefully it's been a case of everyone's read it the same way, come up with the same decision, that makes it really easy to disambiguate. Did you see a hand over here? So, um, in the interest of producing a better specification, here's a, a quick list of what we're about to see. There's a one of the language features that was key to the development of C++11 but didn't actually make the final standard was concepts. You're about to hear a lot more about them over the next few slides, but what we got with out of the, a lot of the work on the concepts was more consistent and simplified wording. That was a big gain even if we didn't get a feature. Um, one of the other features we had in the library is what we call weasel words, where we say, here's a specification, that no, we didn't really mean it. So we wanted to really clean up and say, no, actually, no, we really do mean that. And, ask all the library vendors to, to really play the game. And again, it's just in terms of, Stephen? Other examples of recent words other than, I assume you're referring to stateful allocators. Among several. Okay. I've got a slide on that to oh, go. Cool. In fact, I have two slides, one just for allocators. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a better organization of the layout of the standard, which, which uh, specifications appear next to which. Um, a specific example, Bitset is no longer filed as an associative container. If it's moved completely out of the container section, it's now a utility. So this doesn't particularly change the life that you get your hands on, but it does make it much easier to navigate and use the standard when you're trying to figure out what the, what the specifications are. The standard is our document, that's our product. What do you mean by concepts to the And it's a hint for my next eight slides. Concept. So concepts was a key language feature in the design of C++11. Um, I don't know the audience, does it, anyone here familiar with the idea of concepts you're working on over the history, or is this completely new material for a lot of you? I'm not getting hints either way from my head. So. <laughs> if I say concepts, who thinks I know, they know what I'm talking about? Okay. It's the majority of you, so bear with me, just for the few who, who didn't raise their hands. Essentially, concepts was, I call it a, a metatype system. It was a way to, when you've got a template and you've got those template parameters, put constraints on what those meant, kind of like having a type system puts constraints on the way you can write regular code, non-template code. And it was a very large, complex feature. And it kept growing, because it was going to solve this many more problems, almost geometrically larger than the, the scale of the complexity we hoped. And every time someone had a new problem, I really need the language to solve this. Oh, just put a lip. This is what concept is going to do for you. So even though it was causing problems being so large and complex, it was very much worth that effort of trying to pursue and deliver it. Even if it did turn out to be a costly feature that we never actually managed to, to quite ship, I think it helped a lot in the library. And I say, that's the point. It's fundamental, I think, to the success of the C++ 11 library. But if you want more about concepts specifically, I suggest you attend Larissa's uh, session tomorrow. Yeah. You can tell us about further progress on concepts and some, some exciting work coming out of Clang, I believe. Yeah. So concepts in C++03. Is, we kind of had some notion of concepts in the C++ standard library. We've got a bunch of templates and we've got co implicit contracts on how they all work together. So yeah, we had implied concepts waiting for the language to add the feature. Iterators gave us a fairly good model of something we could describe that we thought we had good concepts for. The algorithms were written in terms of things like iterators, which are using these concepts. And when we start looking at the concepts for containers, it turned out this didn't really look like concepts. And when we started trying to analyze it with a concepts feature, we found we found a wonderful way of shrinking documentation by having some common tables and say these things kind of work the same apart from when they don't and the apart from when they don't really didn't play well with concepts but just from a hundred miles out looking at our specification it wasn't at all clear which requirements really were concepts that meant it and which were just documentation conveniences and we've got a much cleaner understanding of all the contracts that we had in our libraries the consequence of doing the concepts work and therefore we got to clean up and specify much more precisely those contracts that we now have in the specification for what large parts of the library mean. 
So even though concepts didn't go in, it was very valuable as an exercise to try to write a concept-enabled li library. I just want to verify this. There was also an understanding at some point that the um, the prototype concept GCC was able to catch some of those um, ambiguities. Yes, that's the, I believe that's the case. We definitely got bug reports coming back from people who done the initial concept GCC work. They implemented the algorithms and some of the containers and the iterators. It came back saying, hey, this is what all happens, says, but you can't work. Look, we've applied the concepts and here's... <laughs> and yes, we, we've certainly fixed up a number of the algorithms with it as a consequence of that. But. Well, if we discovered that C++03, it described its concepts in terms of syntax. Whereas what you are hoping to get from the concept language feature is the semantic. If I say it models this concept, I expect a bunch of behaviors to come with it, not just that the syntax happens to look that way. It should mean something. And this turned out to be a bit of an impedance mismatch, because we had to maintain or with the library committee, we certainly believe you had to maintain full source code compatibility with the previous version of the language. So the concepts had to reflect what syntax could be accepted by the language. Meanwhile, wonderful new code we would be writing would be able to use the more semantic notion of the concepts a lot better, but that wasn't what we were specifying at this point. So the concepts feature started looking large and unwieldy just because of the backwards compatibility constraints of trying to specify it for the library. We ended up having a syntax that says, I have an equality comparable operator. I have a concept that says I support that syntax. Then a matching concept that says, oh, and this is something similar to the notion of mathematical equality when I see it. So I've got one to say I support the syntax, and another concept to say, and I have the semantic. I don't have any new syntactic requirements, but if you're writing an algorithm that wants equality to really mean equality, you want to use the more restrictive or more meaningful concept. So we're certainly doubling the number of concepts because we've now got the syntactic and the semantic concepts. But even the syntactic concepts, we, you start out with nice, simple things like, you know, I want a, a regular mathematical tab. I've got a notion of what that means. But we already had a library that was just looking for certain facets of this behavior, and suddenly this decomposed into 20 or 30 different concepts. And the features were just growing larger and larger. And this was not making the library more comprehensible, which was a large part of the goal of the feature. So again, just in terms of what was our, we were learning after the standards process, you know, the best of intentions can lead you down some very expensive blind alleys in terms of language design at certain times. But when do you turn around and come back? So what, what did we learn fundamentally from the, uh, the concept exercise? Many of the existing library concepts were underspecified. So even if concepts went away, we've got work to do cleaning up our specification. Too many of the requirements already in the library had exemptions, which is going to come back to my weasel words. Um, the named requirements clause is where we said something is copy constructible turned out to be a very useful documentation scheme because we could say we could define exactly what we meant by copy constructible you support exactly these operations they have these semantics and behaviors in one place and then use that term throughout the whole library and we're not having to provide large verbose descriptions that are either copy pasted and getting out of sync with each other so it gives us a very neat way to describe the library. And what's more, that's now a vocabulary that's standardized that everyone else can use when they're defining their own, documenting their own libraries. So I think if you look at the C++11 standard, we've now got a, a fairly clear section there on requirements on types. I think that's a useful vocabulary that the C++ community at large should be relying on when they're specifying their own code and libraries. So the end result of all this um, concept work was we now have a growing number of these named requirements because they work, they're useful. We now grouped a lot of those requirements that we were finding scattered across the library into a common place right at the front of the library description saying these are the terms that are now used throughout the whole library. And um, well, the container requirements are still special. They still work the way they worked or didn't work before. It's an iterative process. We can't do everything first time around or second or third. But again, the requirements we have, we also managed to remove a number of the escape clauses. So you know, these requirements actually have teeth now. 
one of the uh, other key features, of, one of the big key features coming out of concept is the notion of concept-based overloading. That my type can match that signature if I match those concepts. So I can have you know, stronger concepts that are refinements of other concepts so that a random access iterator is more specific than a bidirectional iterator. So if I match both of those concepts, I will take the more precise one. So we end up with, con with functions that look like they're going to have the same signature, but by the concepts we can determine overload resolution and pick the more optimal way to go. This was a fairly nice feature. And we lost that when we lost concepts. But if we're just happy going at the syntactic level, we found we could abuse the language feature known as Sphini, substitution of failure is not an error. And I'm going to credit for better or worse Howard at the back here with this. Yeah, actually, there were several code conventors of that. It was needed so badly, it got invented in multiple places. But we found that when you're work, working with algorithms that are doing type deduction, so you can't use it in all code, but if, if you, it's just like concepts that work on templates, you're doing some, you're specifying a function template, and you're trying to say, do I find a match for this? Can I compile and run that code? We could start playing clever tricks with the, the spin eye feature to control our overload sets a bit more precisely. So this is another feature that the library took on board and you'll find throughout the library specification there's a, a number of clauses now that have clauses saying you know, this function is selected only if this condition is met, otherwise it's not an error, it's just not selected. And we've got a few library techniques that make writing this kind of code much simpler now. Uh, the enable if template is the easiest way to do this. This is a, a template that has a nested type Type name called type if you meet satisfy a compile time predicate that you invoke the template with. So if I then try and deduce, does that type name exist or not? If the type name doesn't exist, it's a substitution failure. I can't use that type in that context. So I'll have a default argument or the return type using this expression, and suddenly that signature ceases to exist if I don't satisfy the requirements that went into that enable if condition. Now, what can you put into that if condition? Well, we want to be able to do all sorts of wonderful compile time metaprogramming based upon what well, type traits that went into C++ TR1 uh, grew up, not substantially, but a reasonable amount in C++11. We can now ask many more properties about our types. And there's a new facility in the library called Decalval. This is a function that has no definition. Its sole purpose is to have a syntax that can give you a reference to the type that you gave it, so you can then use this in a decal type expression. You're never going to run the code, you're just saying, what's the type of this expression? And if I don't know if the type's copy constructible or movable or any of these things, I can't invent a syntax using it, but I can call the decal val function, and that suddenly gives me something I can reference within the decal type expression while I'm trying to do all this other template metaprogramming. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, hopefully some of the other sessions this week will cover some of that. But this is a lot of feature, a utility that actually makes it much easier to start exploiting some of these tricks, which we have done. So there are now many function templates in the library that do check on these spin eye conditions. And there's a number of other components in the library that got enriched by the ability to use spin eye techniques to supply default implementations if you don't supply all the initial requirements. So it's now actually much easier to write a C++ 11 conforming allocator because the traits facility we use to work with allocators now says, well, if anything you've got to have this function, but if you don't have it, I'm going to, I can now synthesize it all the type for you because I can detect that you didn't have it and go, ah, I now know what to substitute. What I haven't had enough time to judge with all these features is, now we're doing a lot of these template metaprogramming tricks. I don't know what effect that's going to have on compile time. I'll confess that I'm nervous, but I've not yet heard negative reports. So, Stephen? We've observed that uh, so the allocator traits uh, it was actually harming compile time. It was rather significantly just because every container goes through allocator traits now. Um, mm -hmm. So we had to provide a partial specialization to bypass all the uh, spin A logic, uh, which actually noticeably increased per fund massive to use. Um, it, it's one of the more expensive things you can ask a compiler to do. Yeah. So we now have you know, widespread use of spin in some of our constructors, especially in you know, selecting some of these things. I'm optimistic it's not going to turn up an issue, but that's one of the ones I'm watching for. So, 
Next area of cleaning up the stand, the weasel words. So here are some questions that we weaseled on in C++03. Is size on the container always a constant time operation? Does anyone have an example of a size that might not be a constant time operation? We'll see how many, how many of the weasels you're aware of. Divi, you're not allowed to answer. Do a stand up. Standard list. Oh, Sebastian, sorry. Standard list and GCC. Standard list has a requirement that either the size operation or the splice operation is constant time, but we give the compiler by the freedom to choose between the two, despite the requirements tables for containers saying size is always a constant time operation. So for C11, we've fixed and said no, that initial requirement list is correct. We know we can do some smart things on splices that will avoid the cost in a number of the cases, but in the general case, you have to accept that's now going to be linear. Um, coin begin is generally not going to invalidate iterators. Anyone who was in one of my sessions earlier in the week will know the answer to this one. Do we know of a container where coin begin could invalidate iterators? Okay, anyone who was in my earlier session? <laughs> <laughs> Sebastian. Basically, it's a rep count and copy and write standard string. Because begin has to split, uh, has to unique the conversion because it returns a non constant iterator which could be used to modify the string contents. And if you do that, then obviously all iterators referring to the old buff, to the old shared buffer are now invalid. So we have weasel words to enable the copy on write optimization for strings and that actually got removed for a different reason. It was removed because copy on write turned out to be very much pessimization when you were dealing with multi-threaded code, and just to improve our reasoning about these things, um, to do an efficient implementation of, a, of string, we took away that weasel wording, but we did introduce slightly different weasel wording in the process, because we wanted to enable a not popular optimization known as a short string optimization, which now violates a different requirement that when you swap two containers, you don't invalidate iterators, unless one of those containers is a string. We I actually looked that up in all three. Hmm? All three already have the weasel words for really? swapping what it is. I looked that Okay. I stand corrected. We have just retained those weasel words. This is good <laughs> weasel words. We want <laughs> So, are all, are, do all containers have the operator equal equals? I mean. What about the third? Sorry? Oh, I, mean, I missed it. Okay, third bullet. Uh, Requirements of containers are tables. All containers, default constructed containers are empty. True or false? It's an array. Okay. Array is a container. An array has a fixed length. It can't be, well, a, a, a zero size array is going to be empty. But we have to weasel out whether a, this is new weasels we've added. <laughs> uh, again, all, are all containers in water comparable? Anyone think of a, a, a container that can see plus plus 03 or TR1 in it? Uh, <laughs> Might not be equal, might not have an operator equal equals, despite the container tech guarantees guaranteeing all tape, all containers have an equal equal operator. Uh, I tried to find someone other than Sebastian, but you'd be very <laughs> helpful. Anybody who's not a standard library for one. <laughs> I'm not. Okay. <laughs> 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 Let me find you guys to say something. <laughs> yeah, the other the containers. In the general case, having an equality comparison operator is going to be quadratic in behavior, so there was a decision for TR1 not to support that. We reversed that for C11. Um, like actually, it was a, a campaign from my company that in the majority of the common cases where you're trying to do an equality comparison on these things, yes, you don't know the order of the elements, and they might be in different orders in the different containers depending upon how they fall in the hash buckets, but if you contain this, you can determine reasonably easy to contain the same elements and it waits for a degenerate use case such as you've got one bucket that's you've now got one long linked list that's going to be quadratic no matter how how your data's come up but in most of those cases you've already lost the, the nice behavior guarantees you were looking for from an old container anyway and in the places where you really tend to actually want it our use case is we've just made a copy of these things and we're trying to write our test drivers can we assert these two containers have the same value well, what you have to call operator equal equal, that's a very generic way we do these things. And in that case, after, directly after a copy, this is really going to be linear on these containers. And it turns out that the majority of the time we is a useful call for, a meaningful call for the other containers, it was, it was the right call. 
So that was one of the more contentious issues that we now do have all the containers do support operator equal equals. We took that reasonably away. Final question, are all random access iterators mutable? Or specifically, a random access iterator has to be an, both an input iterator and an output iterator. Therefore, must all random access iterators be mutable? It's a bit of a problem if you've got a const iterator for a vector if it's not a random access iterator. So this was, um, maybe not weaseling, but definitely clarification of the wording we needed out in the iterator section. I'm trying to clean that area up. And the weasel on allocators. We have this one, these two wonderful little phrases that are no longer present in the C11 standard. So if you've got an allocator for your container, that you've written your wonderful new allocator, all instances of that allocator are the implementation can assume you've got two allocators at the same time, they will compare equal and they can traffic in memory regardless. So if you've got allocators with state, you're allowed to do that, but the library is equally at liberty to ignore it. It's not required to ignore it, but it's allowed to. And likewise, the, um, the pointers that return from your allocator, we don't support having any kind of have a smart pointer emulation. Or specifically, it means you can't have a smart pointer that might be looking at memory mapped data. It's a classic example of where people want allocators working with clever pointer types. There was an awful lot of work on the way we specify allocators went through C11, and Stefan might not be as enthusiastic as <laughs> some of the rest of us about this. But the end result is now all library containers are required to properly support the, contain the allocators you're allowed to specify in C03. And there's a few extra facilities to, around the edges of this. But again, this is part of putting up our standard and saying, we said something, it's got teeth now, we meant it. So, moving on in a different direction. So, Alistair, does that mean, does that mean you actually will be able to have your um, SCD vector or whatever in shared memory? I've not yet got implementation that does that because I'm not particularly smart with the shared memory APIs. It should be possible, but you'll be trafficking in a pointer that's a smart pointer to do the offsets into that vector. So you better make sure that the data that you're storing in the vector uses the same kind of pointers for its own references. Right. But if you follow the suitable set of rules that the data in the vector is suitable for sto storage and shared memory, it should work. Okay, and this may be slightly off topic, but I know there were a whole 25 other papers and discussions on, mm -hmm. on the allocator topic related to this subject, and did that eventually get adopted in as well? Sorry? That all these additional papers, part of what you're talking about on the last side, slide, to, to make that possible was, was eventually yeah. adopted. The fundamental abstraction is we have something called allocator traits. And now the containers always ask the traits to perform the operation on the allocator for you. Okay. And the traits, this is how you have the simplified notion of allocator. The traits will substitute any of the operations that you don't define. So the set of operations required for an allocator are now much smaller and simpler. Okay but you can extend by providing more specialized implementation for some of these other features. Also, there are scoped allocators now? The scoped allocator adapter is an interesting model for trying to share the same kind of allocator between the container and its elements, which there's certain optimizations that can come around from that if you're using certain kinds of allocator frameworks. Um, we will know more as we get more experience with this model. Uh, so it was largely put in, uh, to clear the request of the company I now work for, I'm very familiar with the allocator model we have at work, which isn't the one that went in the standard, but the one that's in the standard can now support our allocator model as an application. So our next task from our company is to actually come forward with it. And now here's the application that we can plug into all that work that we did in C11. And I suspect we might see other vendors come in with it. Here's another interesting idea that we can do with allocator models. I'd certainly like to see that work go somewhere. It was very interesting. I like where we ended up, but it was a long struggle to get there from where we were. Long struggles are another thing you learn about when <laughs> you sign up for a standard that takes eight years to come out. And I'm very happy I wasn't the one doing the allocator work. So just make a quick name call there. There's a gentleman called Pablo Halpern who every meeting, I think, for about four or five years, would turn up and almost entirely rewrite all the words we had on allocators according to the latest feedback the committee had given him. He seemed to do nothing but write allocator wording for 
four or five years. So you did all the concept version of it, and then we ripped the concepts out, and you have to do it all over again. And I think if he ever sees another RK in his life, he's going to strangle me. <laughs> Naturally, we're asking him to write a partner. <laughs> Got a break. <laughs> Moving along, another lesson we learned. Language changes are disruptive. And oddly enough, in the library, new language features that affect library interfaces are especially disruptive. So what affects the library interface? Something like our value references turned out to be a feature that affects a whole lot of ways in which to specify the library. Lambda expressions are fun things to use. And they really had no impact on the existing library interface that we had. So not all language features are equally disruptive. So if you in the library, try and adopt a feature early, is it just as it's going into the standard, and then call, play around with those words a little and change the specification a little, that can hurt the way you've got your library specification. There's some of the meanings changed underneath your feet. On the other hand, by putting it in the library, we're getting much more exposure on these features. And that was often giving the feedback that led into the core group changing the language under our feet. So, a specific example. R value references. This is a, one of my favorite features in C11. Uh, there are two key applications if you're thinking about in terms of library design. One is the idea of move semantics, which is that we can efficiently move state of an object rather than have to copy it everywhere. And this could be a huge optimization in certain circumstances. It lets you design your APIs much more freely to suddenly returning large expensive objects. It's often not going to be an expensive operation if the majority of that is dynamic state. If you've got an array of million elements, standard array, I can't move that efficiently no matter what. If the elements are also expensive, I might be able to efficiently move some of the elements, but a million elements is still a million elements. But the majority of things we're talking about are things like vector and strings and maps. And the actual object is just a few pointers. So these can move around very efficiently and very easily. And it even simplifies a lot of your reasoning about exception safety and all sorts of things. When you're trying to deal with concurrent code, if you've got move only objects, you generally know you don't have any other copies. Therefore, your needs to synchronization and your reasoning about this can be much simplified. There's a, a real stroke of genius, I think, getting this into the language. And the other idiom that the same feature supports is something called perfect forwarding, which if you're ever tried writing generic libraries for C++03 and you want to handle a number of arguments. And I want to get it. Somebody's calling me with one function and I'm passing it to an argument and I'm passing them to another function. Do I take my arguments by const reference? Well, that limits what I can pass things on to. If I take them by modifiable reference, well, I can no longer pass consts or temporaries to them. Or I could take both, which is, okay, I double the number of signatures for one argument. For five arguments, that's two to the power of five. And that quickly gets very untenable, as you have to start providing all these different combinations. Uh, the neat feature we've got from our value references is a mechanism to deduce exact with the right type of value to be forwarded. And these two different facilities are essentially enabled through some library facilities we added in the utility header. Standard move will help you Say I've got an object that's not a temporary, but I still want to move its state, so I can now easily cast it to the appropriate R value that the thing I'm passing it to will treat it as something it can move from. Whereas if I want to do a similar thing, I'm casting what I've got on the left to being an R value for it potentially, I'll use a standard forward function, and this is how we, um, ex we exploit that for the perfect forwarding. You'll notice that with standard forward, I also have to provide the type I'm forwarding the argument as. So, we then, with these tools at our disposal, we now have a large disruptive change affecting many parts of the library. And we're very lucky Howard Hennant, who provided us a feature, also did a huge amount of work taking each chapter of the library to, in turn and providing all the necessary interface changes to update our library to work with the new model. It was very lucky we had Howard doing that, because at that time Howard was the only person who understood the feature. To an extent, that's still true. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It's an interesting feature that always seems to turn up corner cases as you start playing around and using it. We're going to hear a little bit more about that in the next few slides as well. Uh, unfortunately, the time we did that merging, it ha that we did all these t R value reference updates, it happened that I believe at the same meeting we adopted all the TR1 libraries into the standards. So we suddenly we 
loop enabled and perfect voiding enabled the whole standard library, and we've just handed the whole of TR1 without that facility as well. So, um, I don't think, ha did you have the whole of that work as well to follow up? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Tons yeah. of churn for implementers. Uh, but I mean, in terms of the specification, did you end up having to do the whole of TR1 as well? Or? I believe I did. Yeah, yeah well, we did TR1 before. Um, yeah, right, right. But I mean, that, that, that turned in over the next few meetings as well. But the benefit, of, once we've got all this in, is that any subsequent proposal that all library group is now dealing with, we know our language has changed. So a fundamental part of our process, any paper coming in for review, is now going to be expected to be our value enabled. So at least we're not repeating and churning the work. And we've now got a better way to evaluate and design libraries, which means we really ought to understand how to use the R value reference feature. So there's two key idioms that come back to some of the library design guidelines when you're trying to use R value references. The one notion is move semantic support. So if we're doing move semantics, I'll provide two overloads. One takes the const L value reference, which will copy an L value into that function or take the, a reference to an L value quite happily. Conversely, the um, R value reference will enable me within the logic of that function to assume I've got an R value and I can then do all the clever move tricks. Conversely, if I'm trying to use the perfect forwarding idiom, I provide a single template, which is a function template now, which has the R value reference argument. I do not provide the version with the L value references. And the reason comes down to the way that reference collapsing works when I call this with an L value. It's going to try to deduce what type this is, and type T will be deduced rather than to be the R, the the, the object I passed, it will be a reference to the object I passed. And that will be either an L value reference or an R value reference, depending upon whether or not the object I gave it was an L value or an R value. And that's what enables the perfect forwarding trick to work. Actually, it's used to be either xref or just straight up x, not xrefref. And then you tack on the refref, and that does reference collapse into the L value. So if you're an L value again? So, so if, you're, if you're inspecting T alone, if the original argument was an L value, T will be X rep. If yep. the original argument was an R value, T will be straight up X. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Yes, you will not get it. Which if you do pure perfect boarding where you just say 4 T, you just totally get to ignore that. But as soon as you start inspecting T by itself, that's when people step on that. This is one of the areas where, as I said, at the time Howard was the only person who really understood the feature. There's a lot of subtleties and clever things. As you work with it, you get to understand, and it's well worth the effort. But I think it's going to be one of the interesting areas for the C++ community learning over the next few years. I've got it. I understand our value references. And then they think, oh, but. <laughs> I, I've had many times I've had that eureka moment where I've got about a, a good 80% model, mental model, that just covers our value references. And then there's these funny exceptions to the rules over here that behave slightly differently. And I keep getting good 80% fit. So I think it's a bit like you know, with these grand universal theories, you can kind of model most of it, but you can never get it all within the one theory. But the feature generally is the ultimate do what I want feature. The specification is, the compiler is getting out of your way, just write the simple code and it will generally do what you want. For better or ill. <laughs> so, but one of the main problems that came was we started playing around with this wonderful feature that was actually one of the very early features voted into the, the new C++ standard. This is one of the features that we have more experience with than most of the other features in C++ 11. Therefore, it's one of the issues we've had one of the more longer trails of issues being reported with than most of the other features in C++ 11. So by the initial rules, if a function takes an R, an R value reference, the function itself has no idea whether you've called it with an L value or an R value because it would bind to both. What it relied upon was if I go back to the previous slide, I provide two overloads. So if I call with an L value, I call the first overload. I call with an R value, I call the second. If I've not provided that first overload, I'm going to call the second. And in which case, if the person specifying the API hasn't provided the appropriate sets of overloads, Suddenly I'm moving from L values that is supposed to be what this feature is saving us from. So from within the function, I didn't actually, I couldn't guarantee, there was no way to guarantee that anyone was dealing with a, an R value. In particular, we found out that we had library cases that were, where the, one of the two was spinning out. Mm. And, and so we accidentally lost one of them and we ended up 
Wasn't it back then still a concept? Yeah, that was when that was with concepts. Right. Yeah. So this was part of the original feature design. It seemed like a good idea at the time. That this was especially subtle issues where it looks like you've got both signatures, but you don't realize one of them is not going to match due to a similar condition. You think you've done the job right. Bad things were happening. In corner cases, but there were enough of them. So we, we, we sent this information back to the core folks and the evolution folks, and they came up with some new rules. Now you can no longer bind an L value to an R value reference. And now I had to go back and see what churn effect this would have on the library. And it affected two functions. Because remember, the idiom was always provide both versions anyway. In, in the new world, you still need both versions. The only effect is that if you don't have the version taken with the L value reference, you can't call that function with an L value. So this was a good sign that the original design wasn't actually that far off. But experienced teachers as that we have to move and adapt and see how, just to keep everything in mind and hopefully not break it, too much old code compiled with a new language. Uh, and then we carry on learning. And one of the late breaking features in the evolution group was the idea that we have all these implicitly generated copy constructors, wouldn't it be nice if we could get the same for a move constructor? So now we have implicitly generated move constructors that the library was specified without ever knowing they were going to be there. And then one of those concerns says, but you know, if I don't, if I've got a move constructor and I've, or I've got, if I don't specify one of these missing operations, like if you don't get the default constructor if you supply any other constructors, if I supply a move constructor, this type might not be safely copyable or vice versa. So if you now provide one of those operations, the other is deleted and not accessible, unless you supply both. Now, we'd written a library with many implicitly assumed copy constructors, but we had to supply the move constructor because otherwise these things weren't going to move efficiently. And suddenly we had a library full of move-only types that we didn't even know about. <laughs> this was kind of disturbing. <laughs> and also having fairly late in the process. So the whole notion of whether or not we wanted to do something with the deleting the copy and move constructors became a contentious issue. So this issue is brewing up and being discussed in evolution, and this is two meetings before we're voting out the standard or something silly. So this is very close to the wire, and as a library we have no idea what it's even supposed to look like. This is not a good place to be. So one of the big lessons, yeah, late breaking changes, a very nervous time. Um, luckily, uh, we knew that if we fixed the library to work regardless of what decision Core made and the evolution group made, this was possible. Just always specify both those constructors if you want them. Or if you want only one, always explicitly delete the other. Don't rely on it being implicitly deleted. And then the, the, the library was going to be good. So we basically did that work. and. In the end, I think well, the core language went with the version that would do the week, so it's a good job we had that in our back pocket ready. But uh, that basically went in on the last <laughs> last vote of the last meeting, almost. It was uh, right down to the deadline. Not not fun. But talking about late breaking changes, uh, Dave Abrams came to us with a problem he discovered with the strong exception safety guarantee on some existing code when recompiled with a compiler supporting the new language feature after we've already made the fixes to the R value references. So, you know, the feature's working, it does what we expect it to do, and suddenly we discover that, you know, if you've got a copy constructor, but you've not defined an R value, a move constructor, well, a copy is just an expensive move, so that's what gets called. So, the user's now got a type that they've written, they've not yet upgraded to C11. Let's call it user type, and we're going to store it in a pair with a string and a user type. And now build a vector of these things. Every so often the vector, if you say grow the vector, it now is going to move that internal buffer, all those internal objects across to the new move buffer, which is nice, except and safe, you know, perfectly free, these are the simple move operations, and then add any new elements. The other trouble is, this doesn't have a move constructor, so that internal move is now going to become a copy. But it's going to probably move this string. And or it's certainly going to move, move, try and move the pair. And suddenly I get an exception in the copy. So I've moved half my elements and I've not moved the other half yet. So I've got two partial vectors. And I can't even guarantee that after I move the other half back that they'll all make it. This is really not a good place to be. 
and there's nothing that the library vendor can do to solve this problem. It's just, we may do something that moves work, and they don't. Just tell our users, don't do that. But they've got code that already compiles and does this thing safely today. So we, we had a big problem we had to reconcile. And um, we were very late in the process. We'd already sent out the first document of the new standard for, for um, national body balance and got feedback on that. At this point, you're not allowed in, by the MSL rules to be adding new language features, in theory. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> therefore, we had a new language feature. Remember I said, the, <laughs> how much fun it is to be adding language features late in the process. This is already past our deadline. And we, our value references, again, bring us down here. The end result, we, if we add a new kind of exception specification, that rather than saying what exceptions it throws, simply says whether or not it can throw, and then you know accept operator that simply says, can this expression throw an exception or not by querying for these? The compiler, the library can then be written to ask, is that move I was going to do that I assumed couldn't throw an exception because hey, moves are keep them free. Is that assumption correct? And if it's not, no problem, I'll just go back and use the algorithm knowing I've got to do expensive copies. So adding just these two features, just two, just two new language features, we could go and um, fix the library in those couple of places that needed it. So we now have a nice safe way to fix our libraries. We also have a new language feature we can apply across the whole library. How often do we want to do this? <sighs> so how do we decide when to do this? We don't, we've never had this feature before. There's a bunch of places in the library that it's a lot of code making late breaking edits, but yeah, the documented is not throwing an exception. Maybe it's a good idea. On the other hand, there's only a very small set of places where we actually need this to keep our codes safe and backwards compatible, which is essentially the, uh, the move assignment operators and the uh, move constructors. So clearly it was useful to document the places where we had to, but how far did we want to go the other way and how do we make that call? And, again, this is something I, that was part of my involvement in the library. This is something I, I thought was an important issue. And luckily, everyone else seemed to humor me in the end. Uh, the, the library that we are writing, it's a specification again. It's not an implementation. So we have the notion of, we, we coined the terms wide versus a narrow contract. A wide contract is guaranteed to work whatever input you give it. I multiply two numbers. There's, there's just no failure, but there's no bad input I can give it. I dereference a pointer, that's a narrow contract because my pointer's got to be dereferenceable. It's not allowed to be a null pointer, but it's got a well-defined behavior that's never going to throw as long as I'm staying within the well-defined behavior of the contract. So the notion here is why there is no undefined behavior, narrow to some arguments you can pass that would therefore be an undefined behavior. And it turns out the feature that they've chosen for violating a no-accept specification was an, an inst it was a well-defined termination of your program. So if you start adorning your libraries with things that say no-accept because it guarantees that this function cannot throw an exception, it provides that guarantee only if you call it within contract. So yes, if you call it out of contract, you've got undefined behavior. So yeah, all bets are off. But the language is still going to take the guarantee that if that undefined behavior ends up throwing an exception, you're going to terminate. There's certain kinds of undefined behavior that you no longer have liberty to pursue. And this can affect certain things you're trying to do, like you know, test your library. Common thing, I'll have an assertion that I'll turn into an throwing an exception so that I can catch that specific kind of exception in my test suite to say assertions now throw rather than abort, and I can check that my assert logic is triggering in the right places. That would no longer work if this no except specification was in the specification of the library. On the other hand, it's a perfectly good optimization for the vendors to pursue, as long as it's not part of the mandated library contract. And this gave us a way to at least distinguish and say which contracts we should put the specification on initially, and we can now got time to sit and figure out whether or not my rule of thumb there is the right rule of thumb. But it was a very safe conservative rule. We applied it consistently throughout the library, and these things are generally, you get a new feature coming in and you want to know how to use it. The most useful thing is to have a guideline. <coughs> especially if you're going to change a large, something a feature that can affect the whole library. And especially as your deadline shrinks. Whether it's a good, line or a good, good guideline or a bad guideline, 
spend some time trying to make it the right guideline. But fundamentally, try and produce something consistent, and we can move on and deal with other issues. And I think one of the lessons that was learned through all of this is that experience is vital. You get new library features coming in, you get new libraries coming in, there's going to be an impact and interactions with these things that you weren't expecting, however well you specified and designed them in the first place. And the later a feature comes in, and the less implementation you had with it before it was specified, the greater the uncertainty and the more important that immediate feedback is going to become. I'm not sure, but I don't believe any single feature came into the core language that didn't have some change of specification by the time it made it out the end. Stefan? Did static a circuit churn? I'm not aware of any. Because it was required to take string literals and a bool, I and think it was permitted anywhere, declaration was permitted, and I don't think they ever touched that again. No, we did. You did? Uh, yeah, we did something about the string. There's something about how the vendor had to represent the string when it was emitted as a diagnostic. I'm not sure if that went in before oh. or after. Oh, it's not just unspecified about the diagnostic. Okay. It was clarified, certainly, but I'm okay. not sure but if that they was could just like, drop it on the floor. But there was also something about the, the, the internationalization or, or white strings at that point. Yeah. Oh, whether you could do wide strings. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Not even static because it is your name. Pretty much. However safe and simple you think your feature is going to be, it's going to have an interaction with something somewhere. The one that caught me out was raw spring literals when they had to start unpacking trigraphs. That was not an interaction I expected. So, luckily with the library, the majority of the libraries going in, we have experience, so there's far less churn other than when we start buying into new language features. As I said, it's a virtuous feedback, but it helps build up a lead time as to what point do you think your, your new standard is going to be ready to chip. Uh, specifically, the concurrency library, uh, TR1 for instance, sorry, was an example of, we got some very mature library specifications that were even written after the initial standard had gone out, so we got a much better idea as we were learning how to write specifications, and there was notably less churn on the TR1 types than the majority of the other types in the standard. And a big example going the other way is we had no concurrency library, but we had a mandate that we had to invent one. Because concurrency is the big feature for C11. And that saw significant share in every meeting as it was effectively being designed while it was in the standard document. But yeah, sometimes late invention really is necessary. Concurrency is probably the key feature of C11. Um, and the lack of a concurrency library, I would call it tragic. It's certainly an expectation that we put all this work into the core language, specifying a memory model and how concurrent code works. How do I write it? But when you do, we've got these wonderful rules. We really need to some library facilities to do basic, simple concurrency in the fairly well understood ways. Threading is a fairly well understood model. There's much more interesting models coming out and ways to do map. more wide, widespread distributed concurrency, but you know, let's not go crazy inventing things we didn't have significant experience of. Basic threads, mutexes, and locks that were confusing enough. And uh, so sort of contentious enough, it turned out. So at this point, we didn't have a, a single clear library API that we would be standardizing, or even all the semantics. And in particular, the notion of thread cancellation. So it's explicitly canceling a thread other than the one you're running on. Uh, caused all sorts of problems in certain communities especially when you started trying to link up with C and POSIX that had a notion of cancellation handlers that were totally alien to the C++ model that's trying to want to run destructors as things leave scope. So the end result on that was we came up with a thread library that simply punts on a thread cancellation issue. Unfortunately, we just could not get a good model of thread cancellation that would please everyone. So, we know we have to invent this thing. But um, we still have to proceed with caution. So, a place that had been a good place, to, a good well to go to to draw experience off of C++, we started modeling after the Moose library. But now we've got all these wonderful new library facilities we can play with, especially Move Semantics. So, in perfect forwarding of getting arguments into this thing that you're going to launch into a thread. So, there's some notion of a place to start from and some set of features we want to go in. But when do we know we're done? There's some people who want to be incredibly cautious to the point that 
we don't have experience with a standard thread library, let's just not do it. Let's not specify the wrong thing by mistake and live to regret it. And there's the other extreme of saying, concurrency is the vital future. We have to have all these advanced facilities, thread pools and message pools and all sorts of wonderful concurrency, high level up parallel algorithms and things. What's the right level of balance to pitch for? So the basic model is we, we need the atomics for the uh, basic language guarantees of how a library would work. We knew that threads, mutexes, locks was a familiar programming model. And as a concession to those who wanted something a little bit more advanced, uh, do I have this on the next slide or not? No. Um, we were at the notion that an easier way to launch a thread and asynchronously retrieve a value, we have an async call that's a factory that returns a future object. So the idea is, I spawn a thread that's going to do some kind of computation, and I can retrieve it at a later time from the future object. And if the future hasn't got the value there yet, at that point my program is then going to lock and wait for the uh, synchronization to occur. But it simplifies some notions of you know, trying to write more advanced programs with threads. And as I say, part of this process is we're now inventing a library live and issuing a new working paper with all this wording churning every meeting while people are trying to look to see, you know, we're voting and balloting on this thing that I saw. Isn't this thing supposed to be stable yet? And every meeting that there's churn and invention, I think. It came very close down the wire. I think we've actually got a very nice library. I would say that, I guess, I'm live working group chair, but I think the group, I was not particularly involved in this, this effort, but I think the group did a fantastic job to bring what we've got, composes well with all the other library facilities, and works in a similar kind of manner. But again, boost tracking was standard. Anthony Williams, in particular, who's maintaining the boost library, and has also written a fantastic book about this library. Um, Keeping that in sync with the standards we went along meant that at least we were getting that vital feedback in the feedback loop from the experience that we, we had learned was so vital for making sure these things work the way you expect. Another issue, jumping away from concurrency and like, late breaking language changes, um, ABIs matter. Uh, ABI was a term I didn't know when I joined the standards committee, and it's a term I wish I still didn't know. <laughs> Um, many compiler and even library vendors, they're representing large groups of customers and their customers aren't going to be happy if they get a new compiler and their code breaks. And we're, as a library group, it's very easy to understand when you break an API, you recompile your code and it doesn't work. It doesn't compile even. Okay, I've got a bug, I've got to go fix it. So it's very easy to design libraries that don't break APIs. On the other hand, if I recompile it and it, it compiles, it's going to run, that's going to work. Um, if some of the library structures and the information behind the scenes, if the compiler has changed the way it's mangling some of these names, as a consequence, you may be changing some of those signatures. Um, that ABI means that your code will not necessarily link against the code you compiled last week. So it's simple, you just recompile the world with a new compiler and everything's hunky-dory. Assuming that your customer actually owns all the code that they're compiling, they're not dealing with some third-party library from a supplier who's long since gone out of business and not giving them the source code. These things turn out in the end to matter and were a big issue for a bunch of people. But it turned out that ABIs break for different companies at different times. So it's very hard to be universally aware of this. A classic example, it's a story I love to tell, is when we tried to ban copy on write strings, said this optimization is just not going to work. The HP delegate put up his hand and said, no, that's going to break our ABI, we can't do that. So we reeled off three, four, or five in instant things that, surely this has broken your library ABI, this has broken your library ABI, and said, no, no, you don't understand. ABI is important to us. We're going to hack the compiler to recognize that function used to mangle that way. So if you call this, I know that what you really want to call is this new library function. So I will look for the old names and hack them across to map them to the new ones. We can't make the same kind of change when this happens. So some of these compiler guys were prepared to go to crazy extents to preserve ABI and still play friendly with us in the library. So you just never knew when you were going to hit a well, I certainly never knew when we were going to hit a landmine. And in the NHP, they went away, they did their work, they couldn't find an alternative to going forward with a copy on right spring, so full credit to them, they didn't hold the committee up on that. But you know, we, we gave them a meeting or two to help work on that and see if some way could be found to retrieve that. Another example is the iOS-based 
failure exception. We all know what iOS page failure is used for, correct? Yeah. This is the exception that's generally thrown by the IO streams library. And yeah, everyone loves to use this exception clearly. So we had a wonderful new way of diagnosing errors coming from the operating system in C++11, the system error facility, again, coming originally from Boost. And it kind of makes sense that iOS based failure is indicating a failure that's kind of like a system failure coming through this system. So it'd be really nice to derive iOS based failure from system error, from runtime error, from exception. Well, iOS based failure came from exception, so it's still going to be caught by all the same exception handlers. And technically, you could have implemented it on top of runtime error before if you'd wanted to. So if someone who's relying on not catching that in you know, a standard runtime exception handler was probably fairly sane, because I don't know anyone who actually did it, but technically it was within the rules. So this turned out that, yeah, it's an ABI breakage, but nobody cares because no one uses iOS based failure. <laughs> <laughs> we got away with that one. So, and what time does this session end? Sorry, just so I know. Four o'clock. I have ten minutes left. Okay. Another um, feature thing about la language design or library design, you know, features going into the library. One of the new ideas coming in for C11 is type erasure. And there's two key library types that exploit this. Standard function is a single binary type, but can hold a wide array of functors that you pass to it at runtime. But although you're giving it a wide range of types, it's still one single type that appears in your, ABI, in your APIs. So it's very useful for passing across your system boundaries. This is a very nice facility. And along the way, we discovered that if you have to allocate memory, well, you're doing this only once it happens only in the constructor. So we could type erase the idea even if you're using different kinds of allocators in there as well. Shared pointer has a similar kind of facility where, yes, you still need to know what kind of thing you're pointing at, but the way you dispose of that, we have a deleter policy there that is not part of the type. Likewise, there's many ways you can have different ways of allocating the buffers and the internal storage used by your shared pointer. And because shared pointer is storing all its information away in some kind of dynamic buffer, you can throw the allocator into this dynamic buffer as well, so the end user never needs to see it once they've done their allocation. So you can have a very powerful facility that is a very restricted the number of template parameters it needs. It's very handy for passing these things, as I say, through, through APIs, for general design of, but, slow down and get myself clear again. These are great vocabulary types because you have a single type and people know what they're getting. If, if you compare the system like standard vector, if you want to use a different allocator, well, I now have two different vector types. It's not even sure that they're, it's, you know, that their, their um, iterators, if I pass them to standard algorithms, I might have two different versions of that algorithm being generated now, even though they can, can't possibly be using the allocator when they're trying to figure out when they're iterating over these buffers. So, Unless you have the scary iterators proposal. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are, there are, you don't know what form the iterator is. If the iterator turns out just being a raw pointer, they're clearly as scary as can be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But the idea of type erasure it turns out to be a very useful facility when the library can do it fairly efficiently. So, I see we have those two new library facilities using type erasure. On the other hand, we have something like Unique Pointer, where it turns out that you pay a cost for type erasure because you've got to store all the information about the erased type. Now, Unique Pointer, you, in the basic use case, you want it to be as lean and efficient as a basic raw pointer. Any extra fact is some cost we don't want to pay because that's our big selling point. But we don't want to lose the ability to handle all these other things. So with Unique Pointer, we actually have a separate deleter policy that goes as a second part of the type name. So we still have all, a lot of those facilities that you saw with Shared Pointer, but they now have an impact upon the number of template instantiations you have because you're going to have different types as you use different deleter policies. So this is a decision that we have you weigh it when you're doing your library design, but it's a nice new tool to have in our arsenal, and it's something we were looking at as we were doing so the C++11 work. Uh, why am I mentioning this here? It would be really nice if someone in the room was thinking, you know, this standard stuff sounds fun. I would love someone to come up with a proposal, you know, write up the boost any type, which is the you know, prototypical example of type erasure. I think this would be a fantastic type to have in the standard library. Uh, similarly, uh, the boost file path type that Beeman has been working on, 
it traffics in all sorts of different kinds of strings, but it's a, a simple non-templated type itself. He's using a different technique there. Talk to Bing about it. It's quite, quite a neat piece of technology. But the idea, you know, tabulator and not massively multi spreading our template parameters to the high heavens, turns out to be a fairly useful idea when used in certain contexts. So, what key lessons did I get from the, uh, the process of coming through the library to this point? The standard library that we're, we're defining is essentially it's a specification, not the implementation. There was certainly no substitute for experience with the features that we were working our way through of them. And yeah, sometimes we had to proceed anyway. Concurrency was a classic example. Um, language changes are going to affect the library. Late changes are going to break things. Suddenly we had a lot of move-only types. So keep your eyes open. See what the other key groups are doing. You have to try and stay let, stay abreast of everything that's happening in the C++11 community while focusing on the feature that you want to get working. It's, uh, and yeah, not all language changes are equal. R value references versus lambdas. Both are very highly sought features. One has a big library impact, one just changes how you use the library. So, uh, quick summary of what the key features I saw that came through the C11 library process. Um, and jumping on quickly to the future, where are we going from here? Well, let's say a large part of this session has been about the library process itself and how we develop the library. Um, one of the things we discovered was when we could break, break up into small parallel groups, we could get a lot more work done. So the new notion going forward is we're now going to have study groups to focus on specific features to try to get those features out as smaller TRs, technical specifications, more quickly. So hopefully we can become a more productive committee and get more work in your hands sooner. But we need people to get involved. He said making a quick pitch. Um, <laughs> If you want to get involved, Beam is going to have a session about this on Thursday afternoon, I believe, and I would encourage us all to attend. So the new any new proposals coming in, there's a good chance that if there's a reasonably sound proposal, then we'll spawn a new study group to work on whatever proposal you're coming with, if it's a suitably you know, meaty piece of work that needs to be working on. Meanwhile, work's going to continue with the main standard itself. We're going to continue processing defect reports. Some features are just going to be more appropriate to be queued up and going into the standard in C17 because they're going to interact with the existing components rather than be something that's a bit more standalone. So, final summary what, which study groups have we been working on, just to give you an idea of where we are going. We're still doing a lot more work on concurrency, and that's liable to have an impact on the core language as much as on the library. As new groups are spawning out to work on modules and much easier. That's ways to build C++ and compose C++ systems. There's a file system working group being headed up by Beeman Doors, which we hope will probably be our first study group to publish a new standard, hopefully in just over a year or so, I would hope. But these things are in the hands of the committee. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. And the other next big, big new piece of news is the networking study group, which is taking what you now we've got all this wonderful concurrency, concurrency, it's time we start thinking like a real language. How many languages out there today don't ship out the box with the ability to talk over the internet and communicate between applications? This is a, a story lacking facility in the C++ standard library. There are many solutions out there. So hopefully we'll, in the near future, have some kind of resolution for that. And final group is seems to be forming on the basis of a number of papers in the last mailing where uh, a number of numeric facilities seem to be coming together. Fact, um, large numbers, rational numbers, um, number of algorithms, uh, fixed point of arithmetic. You know, they, they seem to form a nice little cohesive unit, so I'm expecting to have a fifth study group out of the next meeting. And um, with that, I'm done. So, what's happened with TR2? TR2 has spawned a number of working groups. So we don't yet have any notion of a single grabble TR. The, the current working motion is going to be the idea that as we get enough work to ship a document, we will ship one. If we can focus it around a theme like file system, networking, we will do so. If you've got a library that you're not sure where it's going to fit, please submit it. And if we get enough of those, we will probably ship a TR too. In the meantime, the work's not lost, and it's, if 
we don't have a suitable shipping vehicle before the next standard goes out, we'll just be looking to adopt it directly into the library. So please still su keep submitting. But if you spot a theme that things can rationalize around, like I say, a number of people submitted numeric facilities. They didn't know anyone else was doing this. And suddenly we've got an interesting piece of work that could well be our next TR. So, I mean, last time I was on the committee meeting, TR2 proposals for libraries were being accepted in, and has the status of all of that work been rolled back now? TR2 accepted exactly one proposal. There were a number that looked just about a meeting or two away from being accepted when we bit the bullet and said we have to get serious about shipping C11. We wanted to get, you know, we had to be done in 2007. Right. I mean, this was a serious <laughs> shipping issue. So um, that one library is the file system library. So we now have the file system library going forward. Another big one that looked just about ready to me was the Boost ASIO library. Right. And That's why I was curious because the there's distinct talk about that as being the basis of the networking library. But we also have an awful lot of new blood on the committee who just around the last couple of meetings who are looking at different ways of doing networking. So I'm not saying it's back to the drawing board, but it's um, that working group are going to decide what they want to do. I think they're looking at other libraries like Poco, maybe, and I can't remember what the other libraries were that were playing around with some of the uh, ideas of. Internet connections, possibly at the higher level protocols role. And ACO is really good at doing the meeting, getting you up the low layers. And I think there's a focus, a lot of the people in the group are focused on no, we just want to be able to open URL and start talking. Right. So I'm not involved in that study group, I just sit back and monitor. So I'm curious to see where they go. They had their meeting last week. So, how are the, how are the study groups organized and how do they communicate and how do you join one? That was going to talk about. That's indeed part of what he was going to talk about. Okay. Um, do we have a, a clear idea of how the communities, well, the committees we, communicating this kind of information these days? This has been a bit of a deficit of the community. That once you know how to talk to the committee, you can talk to the committee. But until you know how, it's kind of tricky to bootstrap the process. I just turned to Oxford because I knew no better. <laughs> I think if you're, so there, there's separate email that's like through support each of these study groups. If you want to be on one of them, uh, contact someone who's on the committee to, to basically change it and, and you'll, you'll get in within a few weeks, I'm sure. But I think it eventually still runs by uh, 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 There's I'm a big threat right now about how they're moving something. Right, like that's that's I think that's, 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 that's going to take a while. So yeah. for now, it's still going to, uh, it's, ACU is a, is a organization that hosts the, the, mail, the mailing service. Well, um, I mean, I'm on the library working group, mm -hmm. Reflector, but but then I'm curious. I, I don't know about any of this. So, so you sent mail to Andy Kennedy. Uh, you asked, you know, please add me to um, file system study group reflector. It was I thought it was a, a message I sent to all. And normally, if you on one reflector, you should be on all reflectors. It, it is so the challenge all trying to get to information. Yeah. So, so, so I think part of the problem is that the announcement about the study groups went specifically to the all reflector, and I know a bunch of people who are on one of the particular reflectors and fell off of the. All reflector. All reflector. Uh, so if you if you are on any of the reflectors, I would ping Andy and make sure that you're on the all reflector because that's where announcements like this go. Right. And I, I also know that there was exactly two announcements about this and no further communication to the all reflector. I, I spent some time not on the study group reflectors because I missed it as well. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, but they aren't going to the individual ones. That's all. Study group chair who should be. Publicly advertised, but public advertising it that, that well, I don't know where to look to find a list of working group chairs. So. Um, it, was in the, it was in the post mailing. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, just as a, as a data point, is it still the case that you sort of have to go to a meeting to get on a, uh, on a reflector? It was never, it was never was the case. I never was? I've been on the reflectors for like five years and only yeah. attended a program recently. Okay. You, you may need a champion. Okay. Like someone who says, hey, you know, it's my buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, just as for everybody, I've been to several meetings. I kind of had some of the same uh, uh, experiences as Alistair, but I didn't get sucked in quite as deep. <laughs> I've managed to say off the committee, thank you very much. But, um, I mean, as a, as a general rule, people in the boost community are absolutely and totally welcome at meetings. 
And it's a great thing if you know the meeting is in an area where you're close, just show up for a day or two. Um, and you know, you can certainly ask Beeman and many of the other uh, long-time boosters. You can even post on the boost list and ask. And uh, somebody will, will help you, and they would certainly welcome you coming. I'm sure I'm not saying anything out of line or you'll correct me. But, but, yeah, but if you turn up, just don't do what I did, which is hang at the back, too scared to talk to anyone. You're surrounded by all these luminaries of the industry. What, what, what do you know to say? We're a very friendly bunch. And, you know, it's embarrassing if somebody discovers somebody came to a meeting on left and just, you know, we're too busy talking to each other and no one actually spent time to talk to them. Introduce yourself. Yeah. We well, want to talk. I mean, further than that, right? I mean, library working group and at least in the past right it's been the case that you are invited to participate in straw polls and things that happen in that meeting so you can actually give your opinion um, and so you know if you're if there is a proposal that's you know you're interested in that's an even bigger motivation to show up and or perhaps speak to somebody that you've met through boost um, you know that's on the committee and directly reflect your opinion because otherwise that opinion doesn't get shared. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you all. Thank you.